to the geomologist presents everyone and i i feel like i have a special treat for you as you know and it was a very popular it was very well received my um my uh podcast on why you should play warhammer fantasy and today i'm going to continue with why you should play pathfinder we're probably going to specifically talk about pathfinder 2e uh, pathfinder 1 is an, an awesome system that i played for a long time but that's not the current one, although lots of people play it and they still really enjoy it, and there's a lot of things to be said for Pathfinder One, um, and um, well, it's it's kind of I guess descendant Starfinder, right, which is still played a lot. And the special treat really is that B.J. Boyd of the Arcane Alienist is going to join me, and I was actually inspired to put this together because he left me a couple calls. So B.J., if you want to say hi, and then I'll play the calls, and then we can go from there. Good to be here. It's always nice to be considered a special treat uh, <laughs> as rather, rather than just being kind of annoying hindrance or a tag along. So <laughs> thank you for that. Okay. Well, let's hear these calls. Cause I thought they were really cool. And I guess you were inspired to call in because we've been playing uh, the abomination vaults adventure path and playing that on fantasy grounds. Those are my sponsors plugins. I'm just kidding. Um, it's be like but, a congressional uh, hearing. You're going to play back what I've said before and I yeah. have to account for what I, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, I'm gonna we'll see. Uh, it's like a congressional hearing. No. Um, okay, so I'll play the play both messages. Here's the uh, first one. Hey, Carl, it's BJ. I just wanted to say, um, offer a comment on the on, on our Pathfinder Two games. One of the things I'm really appreciating about Pathfinder Two as we've as we've continued to play is how. They have actually made uh, skills mean something more than just roll to be a DC. I mean, I mean, with with some of the healing and um, identification, those those things that you usually have to rely on your spellcasters to do, and then it's the one spell. You know, the cleric becomes a heal bot and never gets to use any of their other spells, and the magic user, you know, has to is obliged to take identify as a spell but I, I like the way that um the skills can be used to identify items and to uh to do other kinds of things that, that you would normally rely on magic to do so that your spells get devoted to other stuff and then in addition to the spells i, I like how they've actually integrated downtime and crafting and those different uh specs of um of things that, that occur outside of combat you get a little more guidance on how to how to handle what you can do um, during exploration and during brief periods of rests and, and during extended you know time back in town to, for as far as crafting items or doing other things that help build up your resources or your or, or your uh your assets uh, so that when you do go back into exploration and combat mode you, you've got some more maybe some more uh, tools or some more information that you wouldn't have had before so I kind, of, I kind of like the way they've done that. I think they've struck a good balance there with with that kind of stuff in Pathfinder. So I'm looking forward to our next session. Thanks. And then, all right. little glitch there, but that's okay. So you could hear those messages all right, I guess? Yeah, yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, the good thing, well, I can edit stuff out if we, but so thank you for those calls, BJ. Uh, really cool is that, you know, it's good to hear that uh, someone honestly is enjoying a game that I'm running. You know, uh, we all, as, as GMs, and you probably felt this before, you're like, oh, you know, crap, did the game go well? How did it go? How did this go across? How did that go across? And yep. despite the the learning curve that we've experienced with Fantasy Grounds, and I thank you also for the help, to helping us to learn that, I think it's gone really well. Um, the last several sessions have been, you know, really flowed very well, um, not just the combat sessions, but then, like you mentioned in your 
um, in your post or in your call, you know, the, the downtime activities. So, uh, yeah, take, you have the floor, BJ, like, ex- <laughs> you, know, you want to expand upon the calls that you made or, you know, what is it that you like about, because you're not just playing in, in the Abomination Vault either, right? Right. I played in two, two different Pathfinder 2E games. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I play in, in, in the one you're running, I'm playing a wizard, although I've taken the, it's not multi class. It's the, you know, the feet tree that allow, is effectively their their use of multi class. So he, he's he's also an alchemist. And I just tried to play a straight up alchemist in the other game, and that's been a little challenge. Um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how it works and, and how to pace myself and manage resources. Um, but what what I've been really seen shine with, and, and I don't know if it, maybe it's just because the way I built my character, but I think it it, it maybe shows a one of the real strengths of Pathfinder 2E is that I feel like there's nothing, I didn't pick something that was wasted. <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, cert- certainly when you play a, you play a wizard, there are going to be certain spells you pick that you don't use as much, but that's a stylistic choice or, or um, situations just never come up. But I, I feel like I, I selected some skills. I selected some feats um, and it had meaning because we, we hit all the different elements of, um, play so we have combat we have exploration we have time in town where we're interacting with npcs or where we can craft things and so i feel like we've all gotten to use those abilities and those skills um over the course of the game so far so that it doesn't feel like you know what, what was the point of picking a background and getting this skill if i don't ever get to use it because you know we never go back to town and i felt like that um you know, I, I kind of compare it to fifth edition D and D because those are the two, you know, big big dogs right now, <laughs> and um, all that stuff is in fifth edition. But the DM has to flip. I mean, flip through multiple sections of multiple books to kind of get it all together. And if I feel like, and I know I haven't been running it, but it seems like I'm got two different DMs. We were making it look like it's pretty easy. It seems like maybe they've put those packages, those things together in a much more straightforward way, either in the rule books or in um, the way they've written these adventure paths. Because I know even even the description of the classes and then the core rule book will say, here's what you can expect. If you decide to be a wizard or an alchemist or a, a champion or whatever it is, here's what you can expect to kind of be your experience of combat. Here's what you can expect to do in downtime, when, you know, in between exploring and adventuring. Here's what you can expect to do during those exploration phases where you're not in combat, but you're still out moving around and facing challenges and hazards and things like that. So I think the the game is presented in a way that makes you think about, okay, I've got a role to play no matter what's going on. And and it gives you the tools to be able to do something meaningful in each of those different, you know, I guess, I guess Wizards calls it the three, um, like all the three tiers. No, it's not the three tiers, the three domains of play in fifth edition. Social interaction, exploration, combat. You get a lot of detailed exploring how to do combat. A little bit on exploration and a tiny little bit on NPC interaction, social activities. And they just kind of leave it. I think they didn't want to step on the DM's toes, but it's kind of like, well, sometimes as a DM, I'd like a little bit of advice from the game designer on how they intended this to work. It seems like Pathfinder maybe is doing a little bit better job of that. Um, of course, that adds a lot more crunch to the system. Probably the right, but I've, game I've, I've played. Seen, um, yeah, not not to interrupt, BJ, but I think I want to bring in a point there is that well, one Pathfinder was made like after Five E, right? So they they could probably see some of the things that might have been missing and try to not necessarily correct, but uh, adjust, you know, for those things that they that the designers felt were missing, uh, namely the exploration and the social, and yeah, and I think. Like I, I've been listening and I've been doing a little bit of research, not a ton, but a little bit of research and hearing to different podcasts and and YouTube videos and and uh, you know the the thing, what does stop take a lot of time and you think oh well it's a lot of crunch and it's going to make for more time and and right the idea that Pathfinder even Pathfinder one has always been Mathfinder is not really true. The fact that you have um, a system and a something in place to do exploration or social combat and not just focus on the totally on the combat means that the gameplay will go more smoothly because the gm is not looking around to see what the hell the rule is or going on the reddit or you know googling okay what how do you do x in you know 
this particular system in 5e. And there, there's a bit of an old school. I said there's a little bit of an old school vibe in that, in that that's one of the real strengths of the BX rule set that everybody yeah, likes. It's, it's now an old school. As soon as you've got a you've got a procedure for hex crawling and wilderness exploration, you've got a procedure, and the DM can always deviate from that if they want to. But you got a default to, to go by if you don't have any better ideas or don't want to. If you just kind of want to put it on autopilot and worry about other stuff. Yeah, so I think that's one of the, the, the points, or like when I've been doing this research, like I said, I, that's one of the points is that gameplay effectively be, is pretty smooth, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's social downtime that we did, crafting, we have rules for it. We can find the rules. I mean, yes, there is a learning curve because you got to know where the rule is, but if you have a PDF, you can type in a find and it's not that hard. And we've well, done and, that. And, and yeah. you know, even some of our players are, are great at that, actually, and, and help me as a GM to do that. But, you know, but then slowly we're like, okay, we know how this is. Once we hit it once or twice, you know, and once we understand how to make a good impression on the merchant or tavern keeper or whatever, now we know the procedure for it. And then we just, you know, roll with it. And, yep. uh, uh, same with, I think, like you were saying, you just you got you got to learn your alchemist, you got to learn your wizard. Um, but once you do, then you kind of know uh, where to go and and how to do it. And I think that might bring us to the next thing that I've seen a lot, and why you should play Pathfinder is this really cool three action economy in combat. Um, I have, I would import that into I, you know, if when I start tinkering with other games, that's on my list of rules to say, let's try this in this system and see if it makes things go. Smooth. It's you don't have to. Do I get a bonus action? Do I get a, you know, well, is that a react? You know, it's just, you can do three things. Right. And you get diminishing returns if you're being basically aggressive and doing things that are attacking and, you know, whether that's through spell or combat or whatever. And, but other than that, you know, you can just, you can do three things and you kind of do them in any order you want and then it's the end of your turn. And, and there's a little bit of strategy. I like the strategy. I'm a strategic player. Mm -hmm. um, I, I like, you know, um, I try. I don't want to get like overly metagamey about games, but I do like knowing the rules and kind of. I do like a little bit of. That's just me. I don't expect everybody else to do it, but I do like a little bit of system mastery from when I play games. That's probably probably the DM in me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and I guess there has been this comment, but I think this is true of other of many other tabletops. That there's there's this illusion of choice, but I, I, you know, I guess eventually people find what is. I mean, like an like in an MMO. People find what is most effective, what your rotation is most effective. Um, you're not beholden to that ever, but mm -hmm. um, people well, you can try new like things, that, though. fall into patterns. But I, I think in Pathfinder, yes, that can happen. But I, mean, I, I feel like people are doing different things. I mean, it's not just, it's not just you know, oh, yeah. people run yeah. up and attack three times, or you know, well, or sorry, run up and attack two times because we have three actions. But you could move three times. You could cast some spells are one, two, sometimes three. I mean, if you want to shoot the area with three magic missiles and you haven't moved, you can do that, right? Mm -hmm. And then interacting with some of your equipment or your gear or changing gear. Um, and then, the like, you talked about, like, the different skills and feats. It seems that they're all very useful. And I, I, I don't just GM Abomination Vaults, but I'm playing in a, in a Pathfinder uh, game where I play, like, um, a, uh, this is kind of cool, I think. A Dampier gunslinger who has a robotic or a clockwork arm, right? And he has a feat where, and I can tactically adjust this, where I can, if I strike, then I can reload my weapon, uh, you know, uh, which yeah. is kind of neat. So, like, you, those, you kind of think about how am I going to move into the situation where I can get a shot off and then reload it, right? Or, or a strike yeah. and then reload my weapon for the next round. You know, so you're thinking really tactically, and, and I, think, I, know, I know this is probably controversial, for example, but they got rid of the attacks of opportunity being a universal feature. But I think yep. that rewards tactical thinking and rewarding your movement and makes it more dynamic. Yep. That's that's the, that was the, a pretty the common pro um, that, the pro of that, right? Yeah, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know how common it was. I say it was common. I, I saw it come up quite a bit back in the third edition three five era of, of, of more than a few very similar in Pathfinder. GMs who scrapped. They scrapped attack of opportunities because nobody will move around the table. <laughs> right, we just want to stay you know? here, stay here. We're just going to do yeah. it. But, but if you know, you, I mean, and the thing is, that what's cool though is that it makes attack of opportunity is kind of a, a cool thing to get, like as a fighter, yeah. um, or another martial class, or like when that monster probably, I would just suspect like dragons, giants, you know, big, mm -hmm. big time monsters, classic monsters probably have that ability, and you just don't want to, you got to be careful what you do around them, right? Because 
it's a surprise and, and whether these creatures have it or not it's got yeah. you got to um, fill them out feel them out and see well, do they have it or not they you know they look big and slow maybe not well that one looks pretty quick that maybe you know they may yeah. be able to pull that off so, uh, but so we've got a uh, so we've got i've got you know you know arlen is playing played a a swashbuckler yeah that's cool but uh, a friend of mine in my other game is playing a swashbuckler and they they're very different characters and even though they kind of built are built on the same chassis because of their choices of feats and ancestry and weapons and things like that they play you know you know the the, the other game i'm playing and the guy's kind of like a frog he's playing a gripply and he's just playing it as kind of a fairy tale frog prince swashbuckling type and you know yeah. it's like he, you he might as well be d'artagnan with you know frog legs yeah. but i think the way arlen has built his character is, is a is a does it seem like a he seems almost to me like a dervish or a berserker even though he's not a barbarian just because of the the way he's built it up with the claws as being his primary weapon and right and and being a lizard person and it just it even though they're built on that same chassis they feel very different yeah it's, i and think that's pretty cool so yeah so it kind of maybe um because of the different ancestries that you can use and and how you can build with in with different feats um mm-hmm. You you really might not you, I, you there's less likely that you will end up with a cookie cutter type of character. Yeah, and, and I think it was so. Also, what I think is neat is that again something that I think was ignored maybe in three five and in, in Pathfinder one is like difficult terrain. I think you can incorporate difficult terrain better uh, because mm-hmm. then players are gonna maybe move through it because they're like, oh, I, I still got some more action to do, or or they'll they'll they can run around it more often, or they don't get stuck in that sort of quagmire. Because yeah. they kind of understand how the the action economy works, and you can, and there's some feats too. I don't know if any of you guys have them, but you could steal actions sometimes, or are there conditions which deprive you of actions? Um, actions can be removed for conditions, or you know, like a slow poison can remove actions. But you can. Yeah, also I got. Play I got hit with a. Uh, I got hit with a slowed condition. Yep. Uh, earlier this week, and lost an action for a round or two. Yeah, and the and the grant actions. There's some there's some class abilities. I'm sure I'm I'm sure like the weird class that our friend is playing, an oracle has some weird buffing abilities. You can grant actions maybe, or like yeah. when you have a pet, when you have a, a a companion or a pet sidekick, then you can grant them an action. And then they get you know that opens up more actions, and, which is kind of yeah. kind of cool. I think it makes a, a dynamic uh, combat. Now we we talked about how ga- about gameplay. I think and and you mentioned conditions and. I know that in Pathfinder, this is something that did kind of get to me after a while was like the number of conditions you have. And I did like how 5e is sort of streamlined conditions. Yeah. So what do you think, what do you think in Pathfinder? Do you think you played enough to, to kind of compare um, that? Or, or what do you think? Well, I, I, I know what it's experienced from a, getting having to contend with a character, not so much as a... You, you could probably speak more to, on, the, on the other side of the screen. But uh, I've noticed that... Um, particularly the monsters, a lot of the monsters have some kind of special ability that imposes a condition on you when you hit them or presence of them or when they attack you. So it's not just a, I hit you, you hit me, and there's a war of attrition. And you try to <laughs> whittle away each other's hit points. It creates... Yeah, unique, it. yeah it, cre- it creates different conditions in combat, which I think is pretty cool. And, and I think we, you know, certain spells and um, and things like that you know, players have the option to do that to their to the their enemies as well. I don't think we've gotten high enough level to really kick all the tires on that particular feature, but well, but I do notice that, like, pretty cool. Uh, our Oracle buddy is uses a very diverse array of abilities, which I think is which I think is kind of cool. I mean, yeah, yeah, an Oracle, if you all don't know, is a sort of a spontaneous uh, divine caster, uh, the uh, divine equivalent of a sorcerer. And this our our little uh, the player who plays our Oracle. I mean, he definitely enjoys Pathfinder. He very much gets into it. But he, you know, he, he buffs, debuffs, heals. You know, you know, stares down. I, I like that intimidating stare that he's used often to kind of mm-hmm. hold a, a, a mob in place. You know, in a way. So you know, he can. It, it's kind of neat that that uh, when when I feel like in other, maybe I have a misimpression and I'm just you know. Uh, because I like Pathfinder 2 a lot, but you know, I feel like in the past, like oracles have just been, you know, just heal heal bots, you know. Yeah. Much like clerics. I mean, I'm, I, you know, but that's my that's my experience with oracles in the past, right? So. Well, you know, there's been a lot of discussion. Not, I don't think here, but I know, I know, like 
Joe Richter's talked about it. We had two or three episodes where he's ongoing discussion about niche protection. Hmm. Um, That's but, a Joe but, Richter of hindsight list. You can go listen yeah. to that. Um, but the comment I made, I called in and I, I've made it before probably on my podcast at some point is um, well, I think one of the strengths of sort of modern game design as much as I like old school games as well is they recognize, you know, from starting pretty much kind of in third edition, but particularly starting in fourth edition D and D they really started to recognize that, you know, what happens when nobody wants to play a cleric? I mean, there are ways, yeah, there, there, there are ways to play without a cleric in the party, but why don't we just give people another way to heal? so that nobody has to play a cleric, or if somebody wants to play a cleric, they get to exercise some of their other class features besides heal spells. Right. Um, similarly with, what if nobody wants to play a rogue? You know, are we just going to say, well, you're just going to have to kick indoors and hope you don't set off any traps, you know, <laughs> because nobody else can kind of pick locks or disarm mechanisms or sneak around the corner without being seen. And so I, I like the way, I, I know D&D has done this, Pathfinder has done this, other games do this, where they they give you a little more latitude by the way they use the skill system. And so like, I'm a, you know, there's an Oracle in this party. There's a Druid in the other game I play in, but, but my characters are still very much part of the equation when it comes to what's our healing capacity, because they both have the medicine skill. They both yeah, that helps healing, healing potions. Um, and so the pressure is not on the, the cleric to go, well, you know, I kind of need to save all that. I need to save all those spells for heal. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, fact, and I even I, the, the fighter in the in the Greek in the game, in the Abomination Vaults game, he's like the thievy guy, right? Because he's he's got yeah. some he has had some background where he can get thievery, you know, yep. trained, and he's like the he's like the trap farmer, open you know, lock picker guy. So I think that's kind of that's cool, you know. That's so you my other... alchemist in uh, in the other game that I play is also the kind of the yeah he, he's a, he's a dwarven alchemist and he's also skill monkey. Yeah, yeah, comes to. Yeah, that's cool. So I, you know, what it, I mean, I guess we kind of t- have we touched on character advancement. I feel like uh, I think feel like we have it. Just like what I've read is that uh, character advancement. Another reason you should play Pathfinder is that when you level, you always get something. You get some mm-hmm. sort of feat, whether it's a skill feat or a class feat or some of the ancestry feats. And, and yep. while it might seem daunting, like we've talked about with all these conditions and things that you can do and different things you can do in combat, I, I it, it's really not as many maths as you think. Things are very specific for one which doesn't make him overpowered but the skills feats gives you like different actions like you just talked about battle medicine like the intimidating stare right that you can you can do like in combat and you know not just those are not just like post combat things right or healing you know you could if you had like someone who had a background as a healer and they're still a fighter they could still probably have get battle medicine you know just depending on their their, be a medic (laughs) It could be a, like combat medic, right? That'd be that's yeah. kind of cool, right? So, so I think that that's kind of neat in, in character advancement. I mean, what is your? I mean, we haven't done a lot yet, but what do you think? Yeah. So far? I mean, well, it's, it's you alluded it's, to it, right? So your your wizard did something. That, you know, they don't have multi classing in Pathfinder two, but took a feat that gave him the abilities of an alchemist, right? Yeah, yeah, and he's not nearly as good an alchemist as an alchemist, but you know what it allows him to do is. Um, well, all we've done with the wizard so far is um, in downtime, um, you know, he can make potions that don't dis- that don't that, l- that are permanent. They don't fade after 24 hours. So he started kind of in our downtime stockpiling healing potions, and then for his daily potion that, that only have 24 hour effect, there are a couple of really good ones that um, complement his spells. So like like particularly my, my favorite one is. Um, the acid flask because you hit something and then the acid stays on them and it continues to do damage round after round until they shake it off or clean it off or make a saving right. throw. Um, so that's a little bit different than a wizard's um, acid. I can't remember the name of the in Pathfinder, the cantrip that just does acid. Mm-hmm. You hit them with a glob of acid and it's over. So it's just all the acid splash. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but, but then he's able to use his, his, his healing skills as a, as a, physician basically to to help people recover hit points so we let's our spell cast our oracle use their spell for other stuff 
Uh, the same thing with the alchemist I'm playing. He can use his medicine skill to do that. His his crafting skill, stockpile healing potion, then he gets much more daily infusion. We are talking about statuses earlier. That's a really cool thing about the, the alchemical bombs that yeah, alchemists can make is they, 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 they put status effects on the targets. So it's not just, do I want to do fire damage or do I want acid damage? Do I want to do lightning damage? It's, oh, well, if I give them lightning damage, they're, they're kind of frazzled and they, they're kind of, I think it stopped it. Their, their movement is slowed a minute because well, they're kind of still twitching. Uh, or I can do the acid and get, just give them persistent damage until they, they save or they jump in a, you know, jump in a pool of water or something. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm, I am liking the characters are more than just their class. And that it means something what the, what they choose to build is sort of their secondary skill set or, or their other things. The other thing that we've discovered recently um, is, uh, Crafters being able to transfer magic from one item to the other. Yeah, that, that's very interesting. I, I was my, I really didn't have my heart and head wrapped around it uh, initially because as a GM, you like you want to give the players like the cool magic item. But then you know when you hear players like, well, that's not my weapon of choice. I'd rather take the magic from that and put it in another one. Yeah. Uh, but, or the but, you know, the vermicelli. Mean, like, there's a vermicelli. Vermicelli to can't talk today. Vermis. Where verm- it's like. Yeah, that huh. Cool. My fighter specialized in the battle axe, and this is the fifth magic battle axe we found. <laughs> What's what are the odds? Because you you start trying to, if it's not coming up randomly, you kind of want to cut them a break. Yeah. No, but but I think I mean it's good because then it does give it does give like some versatility and utility to those like you don't just like toss that extra plus one battle axe in the pile anymore. Or, extra plus one sword in the pile anymore you can transfer yep. that magic to your your fighter's battle axe or whatever yeah and, right? you, and you start you start in downtime people who are trained in crafting and weapons start saying okay who doesn't have a magic weapon okay give me your dagger Rather yeah then you can you, know, you kind of get some some team dynamic and some yeah. team play which i think is very important and say okay let's let's get everyone like on a better playing field for the group to succeed and that yeah. The way that they treat magic, not not just even with the crafting, right? So I think like the fact that they have what divine, arcane, cult. Um, yeah, they've separated it out. They've separated it's not just out two the types. different magics, different types. And then I thought it's just neat that you can. I think for me as a, a just uh, as a narrator in the world, you know, I can talk. I don't, don't have to just talk about spell scrolls. I can talk about alchemical formulas, and I think that's just kind of neat. It makes Galarian a very rich world. It's still vanilla. But I think you know that type of aspect, that aspect, and um, you know the guns that are prevalent, right, in in the default Pathfinder world, it, it's it's still vanilla, but it has some fresh twists. I mean, I think I think I think Galarian is kind of cool. I'm yeah. not real familiar with it, but from what I've experienced it so far, you know, it was real originally just it was a D and D three five world. They, they they added some new monsters, but really when I went with this, where I think the adventure paths are showcasing the things that are not just goblins and orcs. Right. ogres and trolls and lizard man you know you're like um uh it's fresh and it's not it's it's kind of it's it's a high fantasy world but it, it mm. looks different than your a lot of your other kind of carbon cutter carbon copy yeah uh, there's a cohesive design i mean so like even the the initial pathfinder adventure path and i think that's part of another reason to play pathfinder and in galeria you don't have to i mean i'm playing a game that's set in like a you can imagine a, a, a alternate Dickinsonian world where there is magic. So like coal punk, because we're not, you know, we're not in the fancy houses, you know, with our, you know, toilets and stuff. We're we live in the slums, you know, <laughs> and stuff. Like, but uh, it, it's a you could do that with Pathfinder too. You know, you can really. But Galarian is a very rich world, and, and they always throw in uh, it's expanding and living. But even from the beginning, they had like a cohesive back history with some yeah. cataclysms that have happened here and there. Um, and then, I mean, it is a mishmash. I will I'll grant you that. You can find a place that's like, you know, Sword and Planet that has some technology and weird, you know, as well as some fantasy, some techno magic. Um, there's a horror. Raven lofty type of place too, you know. There's a Byzantine type of place. There's a, you know, there's a there's a country where uh, all the, the ruling house worships Asmodeus, the lawful evil god of badness, you know. So, so but then there's there's like a there's even like a place where you could if you wanted to experience a revolution, 
or the French Revolution style, there's something like that. But but yeah. they all, you know, one of the new expansions is actually like an African like continent, you know, called yeah. the Milwaukee Expanse. And yeah, that, like we were talking before, I think what there's, I can think of a, a few, like not even in one hand, the number of African type, you know, African continent. Uh, like the only one I can think of is Schult in Forgotten Realms. Yeah, I mean, well, I guess, but Schult is that's it's, it's just of, a peninsula, I mean, you know, it's not yeah. even really, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's different, you know. And that's a big world, but Cholt is is there. But then, like I think there was a, um, a Calamar had some Symb- some Um I know Harnmaster, but that's a different. Has like a big continent, but but I think yep. they're you know and they they actually have an adventure path in the Moangi Expanse or a few. I think I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but there's a few. So it's kind of yep. neat. So they they you you definitely can get a world hopping type of feel in Galarian, which I think is mm-hmm. kind of neat. Um, so and then well, and like we we encountered some creatures, um, in the, in the other game I'm playing in kind of tropical birds that are just completely out of place. It's part of the mystery of this location. Yeah, the the, the, the game master was like roll. Uh, I can't remember what he had his role and like the, the person who made this successful kind of knowledge based role was like, yeah, these these are native to the Mwangi Expanse. They don't really belong here. Yeah. Uh, somebody would have had to have brought them here. Well, so so just to summarize, so far we've talked about why you should play Pathfinder, uh, the action economy, the character advancement and involvement, especially in, in the downtime and the crafting, the rich world of Galerion. Gameplay, yes, there is a learning curve, but it does become pretty smooth. Um, but another thing I think, which is great, because I've, I've followed Paizo since they had the rights to Dragon and Dungeon way back, um, is the community. Uh, the design, mm-hmm. designers of Paizo are... Are uh, I'd say more accommodating. They're communicative. Um, they interact, and in, in that they interact with the the fan base. Uh, and I think it's yeah. a very accepting community too. Um, more than than you know, you know, Twitter is a is a shit show, right? And, and I think <laughs> their Twitter their Twitter accounts yeah. even have tw- they even have Twitter accounts for their gods, which I think is kind of kind of funny. So you can ask the Asmodeus a question, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> how they'll react but they have a lot of fun with it and i think um mm-hmm. from all of that i've heard yeah the, every place has had their controversy but i think paizo has like dealt with it very quickly um yeah these controversies that they've had so I, i'm trying i'm trying to blank on on what they've been but my my impression has always been whenever paizo something happens they're like you you, you always get the sense that they never do anything out of malice yeah. or um ignorance or uh, not caring. It's usually just an honest, simple, poor choice of words or, oh man, we never thought about that. Whoops. We we never intended to be offensive or insensitive or exclusive or, or anything like that. It's always just been kind of, oh, whoops. Never even thought about that. Sorry. We'll, we'll, we'll address that. Yeah. Yeah. You you feel like you can have a dialogue with them. I think, yeah, wizards, there's something else also I think, very I think cool. wizards has some similar their 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 game designers and their public face like Jeremy Crawford and stuff. They have that they're probably that way as people, but they work for this big corporate Hasbro infrastructure where every public statement they make has to go through a legal department oh, and a PR. <laughs> they're not allowed to talk as freely about stuff. Yeah, maybe that's a benefit of being a smaller company. Or I mean, Paizo's pretty big. I mean, but. Still, you know, they, but they're still pies. They, they have that small company thing. feel. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I would say, you know, with all these things, uh, um, something also very cool is they have like a very generous open license, and they've had this since Pathfinder uh, for one. And you know, you could get all the SRD, the PSRD on yeah. the, online. The archives of Nutthis is a fantastic resource, and everything is, and their open license is very generous. Their open source material is is extant, extensive. And I know some yeah. of our players just use archives of Nethys. Um, you know, we just use that as a reference while we're playing. You know, kind of thing. So uh, it really it really works. It's 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 very helpful. Sometimes yeah. honestly easier to find because because they have a lot of books. You know, they say you only need six books to play, but um, you know the three bestiaries, the uh, the main core rule book, the game master's guide, and the advanced player's guide. But but uh, you know, there's a lot of other things. <laughs> I will say uh-huh. if if I have one criticism, okay, Uh-oh. main criticism, and it may just be because I bought the digest style, digest size version of the book instead of the the big thick hardback. Yeah, but 
I do not like the way they've laid these books out. I think there's maybe too much to me, or maybe I've just gotten so used to reading Wizards of the Coast books and then have gotten spoiled for how simple Gavin Norman stuff is for old school. So I, maybe yeah. it's just me, but I feel like the, the book is really dense to the point that sometimes dense. it's hard to find things. Yep. Um, I get that. I feel like it's, it's interesting. It's like, like on the, sm- on the larger scale, the way that they outline the chapters makes sense. Yeah. Then on the smaller scale, it gets really dense. And then sometimes the comment has been, I mean, I don't think, it, and ultimately this does not affect gameplay, but anything, you know, they, hopefully the designers consider is, you know, like what they arrange all the different feats is not as logical as maybe it could be, um, for example. And, and, and there's for me, that are great, so. For me, it's almost not even the, it, like the chapters makes, but it's um, the, uh, sometimes, sometimes I'll look at a spell or a feat or something. I have to look at three other places to really get to understand what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Because it cross references three or four different rules. Right. But that's kind of common in many games. I know. Yeah. Like in a Warhammer game, we're like, you have to go here. And then to see that sub, you know, then you got to go here. I mean, you got to go to like three different places because it cross references, you know, what it explains, you know. So, But but the nice thing is they've allowed someone to create basically a wiki with everything. And so yes. it's hyperlinked. Well, so that's what I mean. Yes, yeah, so you don't have to flip back and forth. Yep. Um, and that goes back to the community. You know, they're like, "Oh, maybe this isn't the greatest, but we're going to try to fix it <laughs> and yeah. have this, you know, archives of Nethys and other place, platforms you can find things." Well, um, I, I don't know. I, I think you should play Pathfinder. I don't know if you have anything else to add, BJ. Um, uh, I just want to shout out, yep. and I've, I've said this before. I just want to. I just want to say how how impressed I am that the creators of Pathfinder 2 have recycled some concepts from 4th edition <laughs> that everybody hated, and now they right. love it because it's in and Pathfinder. people love them, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess it's you know, like a movement. Multi-classing right? by way of feats. The hero points are kind of like action points. They, 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 do, they don't do the same thing as action points from 4th edition, but it's the same. You start with one. You're guaranteed to earn them. Don't hoard them. Spend them because you know you're going to get some back. Yeah. Um, Pulling the magic out of an item and putting it in, an, in a different item, you know, you could do that in fourth edition, and that yeah, that actually figure that actually figures in a, I think one of the plots in Vox Machina where they're talking about residuum. Oh right, right. You know, that comes from fourth edition D anD D. That was sort of the explanation of you 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 pull the magic and it's in this magical substance called residuum, and then you could use it to forge a new right, item yeah. that, <laughs> of comparable power. Uh, yeah, but yeah, cool. I'm kind of impressed that there's several things in here. I'm like, that seems a lot like it was in 4E, and they're kind of getting away with it. <laughs> the marketing, yeah, Good, goodwill towards your fan base, yeah, goes a long way. But no, other than that, I think it's just, um, uh, I think it's a good example of modern design. You know, mm-hmm. if you want the simple old school stuff, it may not be for you. If, if that's a hill you die on, but if you're if, you, if you're a fan of modern game design, you don't mind the crunch, you don't mind modern concepts, modern mechanics, approaches to the game. This is a pretty well designed, solid game. Yeah, and I think the more I play it, the more I enjoy it. Right? You know, I, I think the more the more I learn about, it, like, oh, that's how that works. And you know, you have like a, a you know idea moment, uh, flash bulb above your you know flash. Lightning, a light bulb above your head moment where you're like, oh, that's how that works. So yeah. I think it's pretty cool with that. And there's definitely some cool OSR games that are on my my top list. So we'll we'll get to those um, or that one. But, uh, but are we guess, gonna do? Are we gonna do why you should play Hyperborea? Oh, for sure. You know that's <laughs> you know that's coming. Um, so especially since I have some really great players in my ongoing uh, Hyperborea game. Ha ha ha. All right. So any. Well, BJ, thank you so much for joining me. I think uh, we've said a lot about Pathfinder. You should you should play it. You should find group to play it. And it might seem daunting. The books are big. Um, it's dense text, but but it really ultimately it plays well, and you can have a very fun character um, that I I contend you know, kind of breaks through that illusion of choice. Yeah, sure. <laughs>